Good morning. Pastor Brian Diffie here, First United Methodist Church in Crossett, Arkansas, and I want to welcome you uh, to our Tuesday morning Bible study. It is such a joy to come to you every Tuesday morning and share in the uh, study of God's Holy Word. Uh, we are studying right now uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Uh, we are at the halfway point in this study. Uh, there are six chapters in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and we are looking at this week the third chapter. And I know uh, for sure that God has some wonderful things to share with us this morning. Uh, so join with me in a word of prayer, and then we will get started with our study. Uh, let's pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for this opportunity once again uh, to come to you and to uh, study your word. And we pray that as we do, our hearts, our minds, our ears will be open and attentive to all that you have to share with us, that we can take it, that we can respond to it, that we can believe it, that we can allow it to shape our lives so that we can ultimately become the people that you were calling us to be. We give you thanks for Paul and the inspiration that you gave to him in writing this letter, knowing that this is a letter not just to a church that existed long ago, but it is a letter to us as well as your church in this present time. So speak, for we are listening to what you have to share with us. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, let's bring up the letter and let's look at what... Um, Paul has to say to us. Uh, once again, I'm going to be looking at this through the Common English Bible. Uh, you can use whatever um, uh, version of the scripture uh, you would like, or you can just follow along with us on the screen. Uh, so let's, let's look at this letter. Paul begins this letter with a scolding. Uh, he says in, uh, in the first verse, the beginning of the first verse, you irrational Galatians. In some translations, he says, you foolish Galatians. Who put a spell on you? Remember the uh, King James Version says, who has bewitched you? Did someone perform some form of magic on you? Did they put a spell on you? I mean, what happened between the time that I shared this message with you and now? Who put a spell on you? He says, Jesus Christ was put on display as crucified before your eyes. I laid the message out plainly. And maybe there were even some who were there in Galatia who were actually witnesses to the crucifixion. We don't know that. But Paul laid it out in detail, Jesus' crucifixion and what it means for each of us, especially for the Galatians, what it means for them as believers. I want you to know this, or I want to know this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? How did you receive the Spirit? Haven't we been over this? How do you receive the Spirit? Is it by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard. Are you so irrational? After you started with the Spirit, are you now finishing up with your own human effort? Is it the Spirit? Is it belief? Or is it human effort? It can't be both. Now, I'll just say this. If you are filled with the Spirit, if you've started with the Spirit, there is going to be some human effort, not in obtaining salvation, but because you are saved. You don't get saved by human effort. You don't obtain salvation by human effort. But because you are saved, you will go forth, and with human effort, you will share the good news. You will uh, feed the, the hungry and clothe the naked and do all of the things that Christ is calling you to do. But your salvation is not because, hum uh, is not because of human effort. That's what the law tells us. And he continues in the fourth verse. Did you experience so much for nothing? 
I wonder if it really was for nothing. I'm beginning to wonder if, if, I, if what I was saying to you just fell on deaf ears. If, if there was no point in me telling you, if, if it's that easy for you to fall back, was it done for nothing? So does the one providing you with the Spirit and working miracles among you do this by you doing the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? Is it doing or is it believing? And Paul's going to lay out logically his case again. He feels he must start from the very beginning. And he says, understand that in the same way Abraham believed, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Those who believe are the children of Abraham. Now, the teachers, the alternative teachers, the ones who were coming and contradicting Paul, they were trying to say that to become a good follower of Jesus, you first had to become a good Jew. And to be a good Jew means that you had to follow the law. But Paul is saying that Abraham, who was the father of our faith to begin with, did he have the law? Did he follow the law? The law was not given until Moses. Was Abraham and Moses, were they contemporaries? No. Abraham came before there was ever any such thing as a law, and he believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Those who believe are the children of Abraham. Not only Jewish people who follow the law, but all who believe, and that means you, and that means me. But when it saw ahead of time that God would make the Gentiles righteous on the basis of faith, Scripture preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. When it, when Scripture saw ahead of time that God would make the Gentiles righteous on the basis of faith, it shared the gospel in advance to Abraham. And what is the gospel? All Gentiles will be blessed in you. The good news that everyone is going to be grafted into, all those who believe and trust in Jesus, whether they be Jew or whether they be Gentile, are going to be grafted in and included into the kingdom of God. Therefore, the knife verse, those who believe, are blessed together with Abraham who believed. So Abraham is a father of faith, not a father of law, not a father of you do and then you obtain, but you believe and you receive. And the 10th verse, all those who rely on the works of the law, and here's Paul's logic, he, here is what he told the Galatians to begin with. All those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, everyone is cursed who does not keep on doing all the things that have been written in the law. When is enough enough? Never, according to the law. We can never do enough to appease God. We can never do enough to please God because that's not what God wants. God doesn't want us to do. God wants us to believe and receive. And then after we believe and we receive, God will inspire us to go and do. But salvation Getting into the kingdom is not about our doing. Since 
No one is made righteous by the law as far as God is concerned. It is clear that the righteous one will live on the basis of faith, not on the basis of you do and you don't do. Because I don't know if you're like me, you find that the more of that you do, the more you find there is to do. You know, we, we, we can leave so much undone. And we stress ourselves out thinking, have I done enough? Is there more to do? What have I left out? Faith is a gift. And a gift is never anything that we, we have to work for. It is a gift. It is given to us by God who loves us. And no one is made righteous by the law. What the law does is point out our need for grace. It points out the fact that there is never enough that you can do to earn salvation. You can't do enough. And the law was given in an effort to say, okay, if you want to be saved, if you really want to be righteous in God's eyes, then here's all these things you need to do. And then we look at it and go, there's no way I could ever do that. And God's like, that's the point. You can't do that. But I can do that through you. I can give this gift to you. So no one is made righteous by the law as far as God is concerned. It is clear that the righteous one will live on the basis of faith. 12th verse. The law isn't based on faith. Rather, the one doing these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Christ took up on himself all of those things that we can't do on our own. All of that stuff that weighs us down. He took that on himself. He became a curse for us because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. He redeemed us so that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus and that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And this is what God promised Abraham, that he would receive a promise. And the promise that he would receive was so much larger than physical descendants. So much larger than that. It is spiritual descendants. And the promise that God made that you look up at the heavens and see the stars that are there, and if you can count them, that's how many descendants I'm going to give you. Spiritual descendants. And all those who believe as Abraham believed are those spiritual descendants. It says, brothers and sisters in the 15th verse, I'll use an example from human experience. No one ignores or makes additions to the validated will. The promises were made to Abraham and to his descendant. It doesn't say, and to the descendants, as if referring to many rather than just one. It says, and to your descendant, who is Christ, and through Christ, doing all that God demands of us, the stuff that we can't do for ourselves, Christ came and did all of that for us. He is the descendant that creates descendants. So Christ is the promised fulfillment of Abraham, God promised Abraham, I will give you a descendant who will produce descendants. I'm saying this, the law which came 430 years later doesn't invalidate the agreement which was previously validated by God so that it cancels the promise. If the inheritance were based upon the law, it would no longer be from the promise. But God has given it graciously to Abraham through a promise. 
It would no longer be a gift. It would be something that we work for, something that we earn. But God gives it to us freely. The promise, the promise that if we believe, if we receive, we can be a part of a great kingdom. Something that we don't have to bog ourselves down with, with rules and regulations and have I done this or have I done that and I'm not worthy to receive. No, it is a gift that Christ gives us through fulfilling that which we can't do on our own. So Paul says that there was a law. It's not denying that there was a law. It's not denying that, uh, that, that, that God gave a certain commandment. So Paul says, why was the law given? It was added because of offenses until the descendant would come to whom the promise had been made. It was put in place through angels by the hands of a mediator. Now, the mediator does not take one side, but God is one. So is the law against the promises of God? Absolutely not. If a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would in fact have come from the law. Righteousness can't come from the law. We cannot be made righteous through the law. And the reason why we know that we cannot be made righteous through the law, because every single year, sacrifices had to be made for the forgiveness of sin. And if the law were in effect, there would never be eternal forgiveness of sin. There would never be one person that could come to God that would have their sins forgiven, their slate wiped clean. It would just be we do as good as we can. We try to live life as righteously as possible, but in the end, we still have to give a sacrifice because we've muddied it up. We've muddled it up. But God says, the law, can never make you righteous. The only one that can make us righteous is Christ. Righteousness does not come from the law, but scripture locked up all things under sin so that the promise based on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ might be given to those who have faith. Before faith came, we were guarded under the law locked up until faith that was coming would be revealed so that the law became our custodian until Christ so that we might be made righteous by faith. And I found something really interesting I want to uh, uh, share with you real quick. Um, it is this right here. So the law uh, had a positive but temporary function. God set it in place to provide protective discipline for the people of Israel for whom the promised seed was come. John Chrysostom, a fourth century Christian preacher, captured the law's positive role in this way. If the law had not been given, sin would have wrecked everything and everyone. There would not have been any Jews to listen to Christ in the first place. The law preserved the seedbed, but the seed had now already come. So the law was given so that things would not be wrecked. The world would not be wrecked until Jesus came. If you look up at the top of the page to teach manners, ensure you know, homework was done, apply discipline to make sure that things were taken care of, that the world was taken care of, that nature was taken care of until uh, Jesus could come along. But now that Jesus has come along, there is no more need for the law because we now become righteous by faith. 
He continues, Scripture locked up all things under sin. Before faith came in the 23rd verse, we were guarded under the law, locked up until faith was coming would be revealed. So that the law became our custodian until Christ, so that we might be made righteous by faith. And do you know that we're a custodian of either the law of trying to do enough and never being able to, or the promise which says that I will make you righteous, not the law. I will come into your heart and into your life and provide you what is needed so that you can be righteous. And then Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. We are now free. We're not locked up. We have freedom in Christ. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So take off the garments of the law. Put on the garments of Christ. And then he says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. There were many in Galatia at that time that were trying to tell people that it's Christ and law. And we can do that too. It's Christ and whatever it is we want to add to it. But it's all about Christ. Christ has come to set us free from the law of sin and death. Because all that the law could do was to show us our sinfulness. Show us our sinfulness, but it can never do anything about that sinfulness. Yes, we could give a sacrifice. Yes, we could go to the temple. And when we walked away, there was no change. Because guess what? You'd have to come back the next year and give another sacrifice. Go to the temple again. But in Christ, we have freedom. In Christ, we have eternal forgiveness of sin. And that doesn't mean that when we come to Christ, we won't ever blow it. I mean, the goal is to get to that point where uh, sin has no more control or allure over us. That, that's, that's the point. Uh, that's the goal that we aspire to. But we have the promise that in Christ, we can have complete, complete and total forgiveness of our sins, something that the law cannot do, because we can't ever be good enough. We can't ever do enough. That's why Christ came and did it for us, so that we can be free. So let's not allow ourselves to be bound any longer. Let's give in to that gift that God freely gives us in Christ that frees us from the law of sin and death. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the third chapter of this book of Galatians. Uh, next week, we will enter into the fourth chapter, and we will be that much closer to the ending. Uh, so I pray that this was uh, enlightening to you, that this was a blessing to you, and I pray that you will continue to look at Galatians and continue to uh, read it and to, uh, to struggle with it and see uh, through the remainder of this week up until the time we come together again what, what God is, is saying to you. But, but let me close our time out with a word of prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks that uh, you give us Christ. 
uh, we try so hard to measure up, but we don't have to. We can come to Christ and he will uh, fill us uh, full of your grace and mercy and he will help us to measure up. We pray that we can accept this free gift that you give us and live into this life that you share with us so that we can truly be the people that you were calling us to be. We give you thanks for this and all things, and we do it in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, God bless, and I will see you next week.